Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I know that most of you do know me, but those who don't, I'm Ellen Umansky, the Carl and Dorothy Bennett Professor of Judaic Studies and Director of the Bennett Center here at Fairfield University. I want to welcome all of you to the third Diane Feigenson Lecture in Jewish Literature. This biennial lecture series is held in memory of Professor Diane Feigenson a longtime member of the Fairfield University faculty and a masterful teacher who died in 2011. These lectures are made possible through an endowment given to the university primarily by Diane's sons, Andrew and Robert, as well as by their extended family. The Feigenson Lectureship recognizes Diane's legacy of outstanding teaching and community involvement during the 20 years that she served on the faculty of our English department. Diane was deeply committed to the work of the Bennett Center for Judaic Studies, as well as to the university's Judaic Studies program, and developed courses on Jewish literature and literature of the Holocaust that became integral components of Fairfield's undergraduate Judaic Studies program. At the inaugural Feigenson Lecture in 2016, Diane's son, Andrew, offered a few words about his mother, helping paint a picture of who Diane Feigenson was. I've asked Andrew to share some words with us this evening. So before I formally introduce tonight's speaker, Nathan Englander, I'd like to welcome to the platform, Andrew Feigenson. My, uh, my daughter here, who's eight years old, Julia, said she already doesn't understand anything. So <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, thank you all for being here. It's amazing to see everybody. It's very meaningful to me. It's meaningful to my family, you know, to Ellen as well. Um, when Ellen asked me to say a few words, I thought, well, you know, what's the best way to start any kind of talk like this? And I know you're thinking the same thing I am. It's Jerry Seinfeld, right? We would start with Jerry Seinfeld. Uh, so it's a quick story. About five years ago, I was asked to, uh, to do a presentation of what they call a TV upfront. And for those of you who don't know what that is, that's when TV networks release their new programs for the year, and they bring in these famous celebrities, and they put them all on stage to entertain a bunch of people who are, who are going to buy ads from them. They try to, try to get advertising dollars. And, and so, so, of course, I'm not a famous celebrity. I'm not really that interesting. I happen to know numbers OK. So they asked me to be the numbers guy up there to talk about numbers. So you got to imagine this. I, I come in, I'm wearing my suit, and uh, I show up, and they bring me down to this green room. And down in the green room, you got like really cool people. Like there's a band with tattoos all over, and uh, Dennis Quaid and David Spade and the Robot Chicken authors, and like it's like they're there's this impressive group. And we're sitting here watching a screen of what's happening on the stage, and and uh, you know, and, and you know, we're all going to be going afterwards. And it starts off with this, you know, the CEO of Sony, and then then they bring in. Jerry Seinfeld, right? And of course, he's talking about like comedians in cars drinking coffee, and the audience is laughing. And, and, and as they bring me up into like the, the back of where the curtains are, I'm thinking, good God, like I got to go on now. And so Jerry Seinfeld wraps up, and he says, and now I'm going to introduce another boring suit. Of course, here I am in my suit. I'm the only guy in a suit. And I walk on, and I don't know why, just out of my mouth, I said, um, uh, Jerry, thanks for opening for me. I'm sure your mom would be proud of you. <laughs> and the whole audience laughed. And I, and I say this because I think my mom would have been proud of me, mainly because one of the courses that she taught here was called Make Them Laugh. And it was all about uh, how, how Yiddish culture ended up influencing America through humor. And she started off talking about the, the Yiddish theater and then moved on to, uh, to, to vaudeville and on to, of course, you know, George Burns and all the way to Jerry Seinfeld, which is about where she, where she wrapped this stuff up. And, and I think what, what impressed me about it was that um, she knew two things about humor. One was, as, um, as, uh, as uh, 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 Mel Brooks once said, was that, that humor is the thing that protects us from the rest of the universe, right? And so when things are tough or you got you know, crazy stuff going on, like, like the coronavirus now, kind of humor gets you through these things, right? But the other thing that was a part of it, and I think what, what she captured in her class really well, was that, uh, that it's also a way of building empathy, 
right? Because when you build in humor, it's a way of understanding each other. And uh, you know, the reason I'm, I'm excited to have Nathan here today is, is what I love about his writing and his books is that it brings this very light way of looking at, at the Jewish culture that I think bridges the gap between who people who are Jewish and not Jewish, and also within the different beliefs people have within Judaism, which are all kind of all over the place as well. Um, so I'm ex very excited to have you here today. Um, so and it's, with that said, I, I wanted to thank you all very much for being here. I want to thank Ellen for, for just keeping these lectures going and everything you do for this program and uh, you know, the university overall for, for, for not just this, but everything they do in the community. Anyone that lives in this community knows Fairfield does a heck of a lot. And, uh, and thank you, Nathan, for being here. So um, yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Just about a year ago, I was reading a review of Nathan Englander's new, newly published novel, Kaddish.com, and I instantly thought Nathan Englander would be the ideal person to deliver the 2020 Diane Feigenson Lecture in Jewish Studies. I wonder if I could get him to come here. Nathan was my ideal choice for several reasons. First, he is a writer who doesn't just happen to be Jewish, but is a writer whose work in one way or another focuses on Jews, Jewish identity, Jewish history, and religious belief, disbelief, or doubt. His works include short stories and novels inhabited by contemporary Orthodox Jews, young and old, Holocaust survivors, scores of rabbis, both modern Orthodox and Hasidic, Jewish writers imprisoned in Stalinist Russia, Israeli spies and West Bank settlers, a Jewish lamiel or fool in 1976 Argentina, and a few American Jewish men who are attracted to or obsessed with pornography. Kaddish.com is Nathan Englander's fifth book, and it focuses not only on Jews, but also perhaps more fully than any of his other works on Judaism itself and the conflict or intersection of religious faith and technology. The second reason I wanted to bring Nathan here is because I love his writing. And in fact, if I could write as well as he does, I might even consider writing fiction. <laughs> the third reason I wanted to bring Nathan to Fairfield University was that I knew Diane Feigenson loved his work. And in fact, just after he published his first short story collection for the relief of unbearable urges, she came into the Bennett Center saw Elaine Bowman, who used to work with me, and apparently recommended that Elaine read Nathan's short story collection. And I know that Diane would have loved to have read and teach Kaddish.com, for she very much believed in exposing students, not just to the value and beauty of Jewish literature, but also to its darkness and humor. Kaddish.com has all of this, with a protagonist who is often sympathetic, but at other times less so. Nathan Englander's work has been favorably compared to that of such giants of modern literature as Philip Roth, Isaac Basheva Singer, Bernard Malamud, Saul Bellow, Nikolai Gogol, James Joyce, John Cheever, and Franz Kafka. For over 20 years, from his first best-selling collection of short stories for the relief of unbearable urges, published in 1999, when he was 29 years old, through the publication of Kaddish.com in hardcover last year and in paperback just a few weeks ago, Nathan continues to write in words that, as one reviewer accurately put it, are both precise and evocative. Uh, Nathan grew up in a modern Orthodox family in Long Island, New York. He attended the Hebrew Academy of Nassau County uh, for high school, which is relevant background for readers of his works, and received his BA degree from SUNY Binghamton. He then earned an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop, a two-year in residence graduate program in creative writing at the University of Iowa. He has won a ton of awards, and with him sitting right in front of me, maybe he doesn't want me to go through all of them, um, I, I can mention that you know, his, his uh, 2012 story collection, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, uh, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in fiction. 
He's also received a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Bard Fiction Prize, a fellowship at the Dorothy and Lewis Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library. Um, there are slew more awards, but in his spare time, he teaches fiction in the MFA program at New York University. It truly is an honor for me to welcome to Fairfield University to deliver this year's Diane Feigenson Lecture in Jewish Literature on the topic, Guilt, Memory, and the Beta God, Nathan Englander. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Mansky. That's, uh, um, a lot of times it's Wikipedia, which is never accurate. Uh, it takes a lot of time to sound that smooth and eloquent. It really takes, uh, Writing takes time, I know. I spend a lot of time alone doing it. Anyway, thank you for a truly like personal and generous introduction that really, really means a lot. Uh, I don't have positive feelings are fleeting with me, so I'm just gonna feel good for one second in front of you and then be depressed again as usual. Uh, and to the Feigens and family, uh, lovely having dinner with you all and meeting you all, and I'm honored to be doing this. Uh, and I really am honored, I'm not doing any, I, I'm in writing mode now, so I'm really, this is my, uh, you can, it's smooth. This is my dress hoodie. That's what I wear for formal occasions, for endowed lectures and things like that, instead of my day-to-day -day hoodie. But um, yeah, I really am in work mode. This is the only thing I'm doing for paperback uh, tour, because I'm, uh, yeah, working on a play right now, but yeah, I'm deep in. So yeah, just means a lot to be here. Um, thank you all for coming out of your houses. Um, there's lots to stream. You have to get back to cheer. It's, are they gonna win? You'll see. Anyway, but uh, yes, thank you all for coming out. Um, and I, yes, this lecture needed a title. I remember getting that email. So I have a title. So I'm going to talk about the guilt, memory, and the beta god. Got it. Uh, I'm going to hit all those points. Uh, and for or a Geneva Convention, I, I always say, I was, yeah, once at this reading where this uh, writer just brought out a stack of books and said, I'm now going to read a little bit from every book I've ever written. And I was like, well, how long is that going to take? Anyway, uh, order of operations for the evening. Uh, I guess I'll set up the book for exactly eight seconds or two minutes. And then I'm going to read you just like the first chapter, which is just so you can hear my voice and hear the book. And then I'll talk about these things. But I really, uh, talking, uh, getting to see this beautiful campus and uh, uh, it's lovely I always like being I saw some people climbing the stag but um, yes it's a campus I always like to leave time I'm talking to Professor uh, Umansky about this but we should leave some time for questions and so I'll really uh, try and leave some space for that anyway um, yeah the book's called cottage.com uh, uh, my wife, uh, we're going to talk about TV. Every writer's writing a TV show now. I'm like, I'm going to write a TV show. Anyway, but the point is, if I'm pitching something, it takes longer than the thing. To, so if I would explain this book, it would actually take longer than if I read you the whole book. Uh, I'm not good at setups. I start telling each joke in order. But uh, yes, it's called Kaddish.com. I got this idea for this book years ago, and the first thing I did was go online and check Kaddish.com, because I really didn't want to write Kaddish.edu or Kaddish.net. It doesn't work for me. It was really weird to have a book tied to its title, but this, you know, marriage of religiosity and the internet, which we'll talk about. But um, yes, I really was just, it was probably a decade after my father had passed away, and I was really thinking about memory and loss and the Kaddish itself, which is the prayer for mourning. It's a pretty safe room, but I'll explain anyway. But um, yes, uh, and I really wanted to write this book about it, and I thought, again, about uh, this person ends up seeking out a site where you can say Kaddish. Basically, he's not up to the task, the main character that you're going to meet in the first chapter, who then becomes born again again, which we'll talk about. But nonetheless, he signs up on a site to say the Kaddish. Um, the only fact I really want to tell you about that is I really tried to buy the site immediately. I was like, I need this site for when there's a book. I got to have Kaddish. And they wouldn't sell it to me. And then my like publisher tried to buy it before there was a book. And then whoever from Germany, like the whole public, they really put the pressure on. They would not sell us this site. So if you want to read about the book online, it's cottage.com.com, which I think is funnier. Back to the joke point. <laughs> I actually thought that was a win. But about six months, I totally forgot about this, but got asked about it at dinner. And I was like, fun fact, stories break their boundaries, you know? And, and uh, you know what? Let's just talk a little and then I'll read. But uh, so, you know, just you, you learn how you write over the years. I, I don't know anything about myself. Like I just do the work and then I find out what it's about after. You know, I spent a decade writing this book on Argentina because I was obsessed with the dirty war and injustice and the desaparecidos. And, you know, then it'll, I'll finish it after a decade and someone will say, this is a book about fathers and sons. And I'll say, I had no idea. So I learn a lot on the road about what I'm doing. And then I call it playing my own grad student. Each city I become more eloquent because I steal someone's question or answer from the last city, because I just tell stories. I only care about the story. 
But back to getting to this book, you know, uh, talking about its Jewishness, you know, that idea. I, uh, I had just written, you know, this book, uh, Dinner at the Center of the Earth, because I lived in Israel for a bunch of years. I'd lived in Jerusalem, and I'd moved there for the peace process. And I was just so heartbroken. I really want my peace back. You know what I'm saying? When Intifada II came, when everything fell apart, and it's just a hot mess you know, since uh, and become a nice model for the complete deconstruction of our republic, which is pretty much a dictatorship at this point. Nonetheless, all politics are welcome. Um, uh, you know, but I just really wanted to go back to this time, visit this time, because you get older. My hair, I have a friend here from college. She looks this, I, I only remember from people at college if they approach and don't scare me, where I'm like, you look like I remember. Otherwise, I'm like, I didn't go to school with you, old man. But nonetheless, uh, as to my gray hair, things change. Time goes by, and I was like, history starts to change, and we forget that things were possible. You know, so I wrote this book, Dinner at the Center of the Earth, because peace was right there. And now we talk about this impossible Middle East peace. I lived in Jerusalem, and we had it. You know, I learned as we watched the world over that it takes maybe four or five people to deconstruct everything that tens of thousands and millions of people have built in good faith. And I wanted my peace back, so I wrote this book that had like maybe six times lines and five genres, and like my head hurts just trying to explain it. It's set on four continents. It was impossible to construct. I call it like a traducan of a novel because it's like a, you know, it's really like a, magic realist literary thriller historical novel you know it's you know each one's stuffed into the next but the point is i wanted to go back to basics which are the two points of this book that i want to set it up with which is where i started you know that introduction made me think of all this where i started like talking about the jewish community and a world i grew up in i was like i want to go revisit it but 20 years later you know like what is it like to go back to this space and again after all the timelines i wanted a singular arc someone on a journey and I also wanted to, uh, I, I spent you know, 20 years back to comparisons to Roth, and I had a nice relationship with Philip Roth over the years. You know, he was having this, answering this same question for a million years, where I'm you know, many generations American, but I have to be a hyphenated writer, a Jewish writer. I was like, why don't I get to just be American? You know what I'm saying? John Cheever didn't have to be a Christian writer. You know what I'm saying? Like he, um, you know, Updike, like they get to be an American, I just, for 20 years, but back to this moment and back to what's happening and back to how this country has shifted, I was like, oh, I'm as Jewish as they come, you know. Now I write with like 10 yarmulkes stacked on my head. But uh, so this is oddly, uh, in way of introduction, my most Jewish book yet, which also makes me dizzy because I was like, if each book is the most Jewish a book could be, how, this, how could it be the most more than anything? But I really do believe, uh, you know, I'm working in theater now. I, said, I think I said I was working on this play. The framing devices, like this, the, the more focused a world, the tighter is, the more universal it better become. Like it, you can go on a deep, deep dive and then it opens out. So. Yeah, back to looking at the cottage. I think that started when you say, where do stories come from? I started to learn the dark jokes of how I work. You know what I'm saying? Like I used to have long, long hair down my back, picture maybe a Cher circa Moonstruck or the drummer from Rat. You know, like I look like that and I'd go to like Shabbos dinner at my sister's who wears a wig and is very religious and her friends would say like, oh, I can make such a wig out of that hair. That's a good joke. But jokes have no mass, you know what I'm saying? They have no, and I get very interested. I've started to learn. Like I thought, what about a Hasidic woman who makes wigs, who would never in her own community with a close friend, never be alone in a room with a man, not her husband, let alone appro approach a stranger, you know, in Chelsea with long, long hair that she just has to have. Like I started to see how those things became stories. Like my story, Reb Kringle, it's, you know, a big Hasidic rabbi, the big belly, the long beard, the whole look, you know, and he can't afford to pay his rent, so he works as Santa Claus in a, you know, <laughs> you know, at Macy's. So, so, you know, to bring that all home, the 90 threads that I've got going so that I can read, but like that notion, which is, you know, two things, like the joke of this, like I started to see, uh, which is I'm you know, radically, radically, radically secular, you know, except I'm very bad at being secular, and I think my wife's always afraid she's gonna walk in the door and I'll be like nailing up 20 mezuzahs and eating humantashin and like, you know, I'm really hair trigger. It's like I should get, if they gave like AA chips to not religious, I count every day that I stay not religious. You know, it really is a battle for me, you know. So I was thinking about the flip of the flip. You know, I'm saying that's the core of this book, but back to, uh, 
that uh, Santa Claus story, what I want to say there is I have met in the last 20 years every single Jewish Santa Claus in America, and they are legion. I'm sure one of you will come forward tonight. So as you dream these stories and put them out into the world, I say I learn from community to community. I also find the truth. There's nothing you can write down that doesn't become true. You know, I have a story where I talk about Gabernia. For years, my family were from Gabernia. That's all I know is that my great grandmother came from Gabernia in Russia, but I learned that it just means state, like New York State. You know what I'm saying? It just means, it's like we were walking around and saying we're from state or province, you know. But I told the story in San Francisco like 15 years ago, and this woman came up to me. She was like, you know, I'd say in her late 60s or something like that, and she's like, her whole life, she's like, I'm from Gabernia too, you know. <laughs> So uh, back to this website uh, and what I'm talking about. So about six months, did I tell this part yet? Did I finish the story? I don't think I did. But um, I have a seven month old, by the way, now. So as long as I don't fall asleep at the thing. So back to not doing events. So I haven't slept in about 54 days. The other thing my wife told me, never say you're tired on book tour or traveling. Because she's like, I was up at four. Anyway, um, so yes, the end of the cottage.com thing is I wanted this website. We couldn't get this website. I was doing this book. I have to have it. But I'm back to stories breaking their boundaries. About six months after the book came out, I got a call from a journalist uh, asking me what I felt uh, about the site. So the, uh, whoever owned it or was able to own it read the book uh, and liked the book. And uh, so the story that is a made-up story about Kaddish.com has now become a real website where you can uh, hire people to say the prayer for the dead, which I always forget to say, but it's of interest. And there's a very a Jewish idea. If you, there's ideas if you like uh, help, you know, if you introduce a Jewish couple and they get married, like there's ways to get into heaven, but I'm wondering if there's any uh, proxy way that I get in for, you know, na uh, now that this site has gone live. Um, that's the longest introduction I've ever given. Uh, I'm really gonna read for, yeah, 10 or 12 minutes and then I will uh, talk about a couple of things and then we'll chat to each other, which I'm all excited about. Mirrors covered in front door jar, collar torn and sporting a shadow of beard, Larry leans against the granite top of his sister's fancy kitchen island. He says, everyone's staring at me, all of your friends. That's what people do, Dina tells him. They come, they say kind things, they feel uncomfortable, and they stare. It's only hours after the funeral, and honestly, Larry hates himself for bringing it up. He really thought nothing could add to the despair of his father's loss, but this, this quiet, muttering stream of well-wishers has made it for Larry all the worse. What he's taking issue with is the look that he's getting. It's not the usual pain nod one naturally offers. Larry's convinced there's a bite to it, condemning. He doesn't know how he'll survive a week trapped in his sister's home, in his sister's community, when every time one of the visitors glances over, Larry feels himself appraised. And so he keeps raising his hand to the top of his head, checking for the yarmulke sitting there like a hubcap for all its emotional weight. Its absence at his own father's shiva would be the same as standing naked before them. Sneaked off into the kitchen with his sister, their first moment alone, Larry unloads his complaints in a hiss. Tell them, he says, to stop looking my way. At a condolence call, you want them not to look at the, Dina pauses, what are we, the condoled, the aggrieved, we are the grievances. The mourner, she says, you want them not to show that they care. I want them not to judge me just because I left their stupid world. Dina laughs her first since they put their father into the ground. This is so like you, his sister tells him, to make it negative, to complicate what can't be any more simple. This bitterness in the face of what is pure niceness is on you. On me, are you kidding? Are you really saying that today? You know that I am, little brother. I love you, Larry. But if you choose even yes today to throw one of your fits, my fits, don't yell, Larry. People can hear. Fuck the people. Oh, that's nice. I mean it, Larry says, thinking that fit may not be a completely inappropriate word. Go on then. Curse the terrible people who will cook for us and feed us and drive carpool for me all week and make sure that we don't mourn alone. Yes, curse at the nice man who washed our father's body and prepared the shroud and laid the hands atop his eyes and now come to make a minion in this house. Spare me, Dina. It's my morning, too, and I should get to feel at home in your home as much as them. Who's saying different? 
But you have to understand, they aren't used to it, Larry, used to what you do. Dina takes a breath, reorganizing her thoughts. Memphis Jews are even more conservative than the ones we grew up with. In Brooklyn, even the edgeless have an edge. Here, if you're going to be radical, people may a little bit stare. Larry's now the one staring. He stands before his older sister, giving her the best of his blank looks about what he was doing that anyone could think radical. Larry has no clue. Tell me you don't know, she says. Honestly, tell me it's not on purpose that you've actually forgotten so much. Honestly, honestly, I don't I. And here Larry was going to swear, which Orthodox Jews are forbidden to do. In deference not so much to his sister, but to the opportunity to prove his innocence, that he is not as odd a duck as they think him, that he isn't doing anything anyone would consider wrong, Larry writes his sentence and, with a stutter, ends it on the word promise, I promise, he says. You really need me to tell you? I do. Dina rolls her eyes as she has since Larry was old enough to understand what it meant and likely before. She explains what she's sure he knows and is, without a doubt, doing on purpose. You step out into the yard. You read a book, she says with true sisterly fury. You sit like it's nothing on a regular chair. Larry straightens up at that, pushing with his hands against the counter, stepping back into the radius of his offense. He gives himself a moment, letting the blood flow to his cheeks, his face reddening as if like a chameleon he can change color at will. It's no reason to treat me like a freak, he says. They're just stupid rules. But even as he says it, rebellious little brother that he is, black sheep, and yes, apostate, Larry understands that for Dina, they're much more than that. For him to step out of the house, to read a page for pleasure, and above all, to reject that special Shiva perch, the low chair, the wooden box, a couch with the cushions removed, it is too much. The ancient pose, the mourner sitting slope-shouldered, ashen face, and close to the ground, it represents for Dina pure sorrow. A stupid chair isn't what makes it mourning, Larry says, doubling down, though he knows for his sister a chair absolutely did. There lies Larry wedged in his nephew's narrow bed, in his nephew's narrow room, freezing under a thin polyester comforter in Dina's arctically over-air-conditioned house. Sleep does not come on the first night of mourning when Larry, mustering all his zazen-based mindfulness, cannot disengage from the shock of his own thoughts. He wants to scream daddy, and he wants to scream mommy, and it's that pure regression on top of the grief that has him so alarmed, a grown man frustrated with his frustration, wrestling to keep his hurt pent up. If Larry wasn't already headed there on his own, Dina had nudged him the rest of the way back to childhood by sticking him in an 11-year-old's lair instead of settling her 30-year-old brother in the more uncle-worthy den. But the den is where their father had taken sick during his Passover visit. It's where he'd convalesced between the many trips to the hospital until his final fateful admittance. That room was blocked off in Dina's mind. And so this skinny bed for Larry, on which he flips to face the glow of his nephew's aquarium. Its watery light bathes him while illuminating the wall opposite, the fish gliding before a shelf of giant trophies, the likes of which Larry in his sporting years had never won. And now he does not want to yell for his parents, but yell at his sister, furious over what he couldn't exactly say. Maybe it's the light of the tank turned blinding, keeping a sleepless man awake. Maybe it's because in their already tiny family, his big sister hadn't been able to make their father not die. Or because when he was his nephew's tender age, Dina, older, wiser, hadn't been able to stop their flaky mother from running off to Marin County with Dennis, her ridiculous new age husband, the newlyweds fresh from a marriage that took place the very day their dear father held the get in his hands. Their mother had literally gone from her divorce in rabbinical court straight to a chuppah in Prospect Park. She'd forced Larry to hold one of the supporting poles while Dennis broke the glass, stomping it with his fat Birkenstock foot. Larry shakes his head at the memory and pressing a pillow over his face until he sees stars, he figures he's maybe mad at Dina simply for representing all that was left of the only family unit he'd ever known. Now it was the two of them alone. Except Dina is not alone. She has her husband and her three kids and the hundreds of religious clans people who'd pour in all week, these southern Memphis Gracelandian Jews who'd never give up or go away. 
Larry, overcome with exhaustion and emotion, with the endless exploration of his sorrows, gives up and crawls from bed. He yanks the fish tank's plug from the wall with a force edging on violence and sighs with relief as a restorative darkness floods the room. Feeling his way back under the boy's blanket, tucking himself in, Larry floats towards sleep in that wonderful blackness. But he can't let go, haunted as he is by the thoughts of death and of dirt, of gravel thrumming against coffin, and the literal specter of a soul formerly separating from its body, his father's ghost on the loose. With Larry's own body stretched out in the narrow casket of a bed and chock full of superstition, it's as if he dug up his old religious self just as his father was buried. Eyes closed, he tries again and again to let himself drift, but his ears train themselves on the fish in the tank concerned with their well-being. More and more, Larry worries that by pulling the plug, he turned off the whole contraption, that he'd somehow suffocate the fish or undrown them, or whatever the term is for stopping things that breathe underwater from doing whatever it is that they do. He can't quite obviously hear them swimming, so he instead tries to isolate the sound of the water filter, separating it from the unfamiliar electrical hum of the house, but everything is overpowered by the drone of whatever tireless compressor is anchored nearby and forcing all that icy air through the vent above his bed. So Larry opens his eyes again, stirring further and strains his vision against the darkness, hoping to make out the smokestack of bubbles rising from that stupid aquarium's pump. He is, and he knows it's not rational, fully terrified that the family will wake to another set of funerals, all of them his idiotic avuncular fault. He pictures them all crunched into the bathroom in their funereal clothing, now poised over one of the house's stately, silent flush, rich person toilets. Larry's nephew will preside while his two nieces, like pallbearers, hold a fish-heavy skimmer, the kids watching those murdered charges tumble off to their maker, just as they had with their grandfather the day before. Every time sleep comes, the fish pull Larry back until he drags himself from bed to plug the damn thing back in. With the light burning, Larry gives himself over to the endless of the night, lying there missing his father, loving his father, who white bearded and full of faith had been the only one from Larry's old life, from their cloistered community, who saw his true nature, loving Larry for exactly who he was and cherishing the man he'd become. I want you to know, his father had said from his hospital bed, that you in this world and the next will be fine. You think, Larry had said? Do you know what I think? I'm asking. I think the world to come is just a long table where everyone on both sides sits men and women. Pets? No pets, his father said. None? Fine, his father said. Under the table, the dogs and cats, but no birds. I can't picture it with birds. Fair enough, Larry said. This long table with its perfect white cloth is set not with food and drink, but with the Torah copies for everyone so that you can read to yourself or learn in pairs. I can picture that. And you know what happens at this table? What? All you do for eternity is study, nothing else, no interruption, no day, no night, no weekend or holiday, no you may hagrachol, for it is the afterlife, time unbroken, all of it given over to one purpose. Sure, Larry said. This is why, for the souls gathered, that single place serves as both heaven and hell. Here his father had gulped at the air, fish like himself. It goes like this, his father said. If you got a good mind and a good heart, if you like to learn Torah and take interest in knowledge, then studying for eternity is for you heaven. He had looked to his son and Larry had nodded. And if all you want is to waste your time on narishkeit and bunk stuff to think your greedy thoughts, though the money is gone, and to think your dirty thoughts, though your schwanz is buried down below, that for you that same table is tortured. Then sitting there with your bad brain, you find yourself in hell. Larry considered the idea poised at his father's side, partly he thought it was funny and thought about making a Larry-like joke, but being his father's son, Larry also took it seriously. He was awed at the notion and somehow afraid. His father, who could read him like no one else, reached out with his liver-spotted hand and laying it atop Larry said, I'm sure in that place for you it would be heaven. Larry had gasped, not from surprise, but choking back the rush of comfort he took in his father's ruling. Trust me, Larry, it's all right that you don't believe. This period in your life, it feels like it's forever, but if you're lucky, life is long and each of these forevers will one day seem fleeting. You think when I was your age that I could have pictured this? that it would be 1999, the edge of a new millennium, and I'd be saying goodbye to a handsome grown son at the end of my days. 
I can tell you that even back then, I already felt old and thought I knew it all. His father gave a, squeak, a weak squeeze to Larry's hand. You're a good boy, and I pray that I don't see you across from me until you reach 120 years. But for you, my boy chick, when it's the right time to take your seat, that table will feel like a blessing without end. I'll stop there. Um, thank you. So yeah, I think you know that'll start us with uh, the guilt part and the memory part. But you know, I was trying to think. You know, work gets it gets political for me quick. But I think only if you're you know if you're Orwell, you can write politics intentionally. You have to just be your true self. Didactic work is it. Fiction cannot sour like milk. We were just talking with great passion about Custom of the Country, you know, a 100-year-old Wharton novel that reads like it was written yesterday. Like, it has to stay current, and it also, your intent, writers don't, you know, don't ask them to babysit, don't lend them money, don't, like, ask them to pick you up at the airport. Like, it's a terrible, you know, a broken bunch of people. They're all my dearest friends, like I am one of them. But when you're working, that's a separate system of weights and measures. Like, your heart has to be in the right place when you work. You know what I'm saying? If you don't understand good and evil, you can't write characters. You know what I'm saying? Like it doesn't, it's not about funny or sad, but you have to understand up needs to read up and down needs to read, you know, down. And I think, you know, your true self, it like edges, you know, into your work. And that's gotta be, it's like operating, you know, procedure. So politics for me, that's that's a personal thing. But what I think about, uh, you know, back to having lived in Israel when I talk about this last book, the books work in pairs for me. When I look at this one, it's about, you know, I think so much about our country torn. You know, something that's happened that we've, you know, imported from, I think, like Israel to America. It took me a long time there to understand that I was living a Jewish boy in Jerusalem and my holy site was Har Abayat, like the Temple Mount, and that my Palestinian neighbor was living in Il Quds, like a separate city, you know what I'm saying? And Haram al Sharif, a separate holy site. Like we weren't on ends of a disagreement or a spectrum, we were two functioning realities. But we have that in the States now. We have, you know, we, you got your MSNBC and your Fox News. We have two separate realities. We are so split and it's torn the communities apart. It's torn the whole country apart. But, you know, my universe, it's not a partial universe. It's not a kind of universe. It's not a hyphenated America. The world to me is all Jewish. You know, I was on book tour in Moscow last year. Like any country I get to, I'm in like Moscow four hours and I'm drinking whiskey with Hasidim and having like the best Georgian kosher food. Like the whole world's Jewish to me. So when I write a book like this that's so insular and so navel gazy, it is a universal. And what I wanted to look at, back to guilt and that pressure, I wanted to look at a family how families, you know, what is a country, what is society, why have a civilization if we're not gonna take care of each other? But nothing sums up family and community more than mourning, and nothing puts more pressure on a family than a disagreement about mourning, and fiction better be the most pressurized form. That is, you meet the dean of the sister in this book, you know, she's not, egalitarian, she doesn't want the separation between men and women to come down, she doesn't want the right to say this prayer, she wants to be Jewish in the way she's Jewish, and you know, does not want this responsibility. What she wants is her brother, the only male in the family, to have this responsibility, and their father, who you just met, wants the Kaddish set over him. Like, back to empathy, like it's what I'm, we have such a short of empathy, now, what obsesses me in fiction is ideas of empathy, but it, you have to be able to understand the other side even if you don't get it at all or think it's bonkers. But to this father, to this sister, when a Jewish soul dies and goes to the next world, which I think we took from the Romans, there's a lot of professors here, it's not the Greeks, we didn't have heaven and hell. I like the old Jews, we had Sheol, we had limbo, we had witches. I liked when we had witches. Go read a witch of, you know, Andor. Anyway, I like me a witch. Anyway, nonetheless, we have heaven and hell now. But really, you have this conscious of Olam Haba, which still touches on that, which is the world to come. It's a singular space in that way. But this idea, when the father dies, for a year, his soul is being judged. And if someone doesn't go to a minion three times a day, like to pray, to go to synagogue, not from home, to be with 10 men at quorum and say this prayer for the dead eight times a day. So you have to three times a day, leave your house, go say a prayer with a group and say this prayer eight times a day. Like if you skip it, daddy burns in hell. Like for real, hell fires, you know what I'm saying? And I just wanted to set up that thing for a brother who is not religious, who is secular, who has left the fold, 
hold the expectation that he is going to go to synagogue three times a day for 11 months and not miss one, not once, you know, be like, there's a spin class, you know, no skipping, you know, like that is an impossible ask. And that to me is what sets up the pressurized form of fiction to set this brother and sister at odds, you know what I'm saying? And what happens, you know, which is uh, my super long and windy introduction, the born again again part, I was thinking about this book has an elision, I love negative space, I love absence. Just the idea of me being here, of all of us being together, like this group of people, it takes infinity for this room to have gathered. It's never happened before. It'll never happen this way again. But what makes it real is I don't have all your stories. You know what I'm saying? Like I say, like, you know, we met, I say this. That absence is what ma every fact makes things unreal. Boring backstory makes things unreal. What you need is just life happens. And there is a skip. 20 years later, we just meet him, and he's super orthodox again. He's got the beard and the belly and the suit, you know, and he's born again again. Because I was really thinking about that, that we get one flip. You know what I'm saying? I just, I turned 50. God help me. It happens. Anyway, I like it. It feels good. The build up, my mom reminded me. I was so upset. She's like, don't you remember? I cried every single day for a year when I was 49. I was like, I do remember that. The morning of feels great. I feel good. Anyway, but, uh, you know, you know, like, Back to this notion of change, I still get introduced as, you know, he left ortho, you're like defined by these things of childhood. Like, and I thought about this idea. I love a good Jewish wedding. Like, I like to dance, you know what I'm saying? I like, I like that food, you know what I'm saying? I like to go home and I thought, how strange, back to Gil Galim would obsess me, the cycles of life. Like, wouldn't it be more normal if more people switch back? You know, like, that's it. You get to, you know, change sexuality once. You get to, like, change political, but we don't want, you want to become a libertarian? We'll hear about it for like an hour, but like, you don't get to switch back. You get, we all get one switch. And I wanted to give this person a second switch, you know, back to this idea of memory, of childhood, of loving those things. And that's where we find him back in this world. And back to the guilt part, there's this notion of tikkun olam, of, of putting things right. And I love the idea of hiring someone, by the way, for the Kaddish is totally as kosher as can be. One thing I like about Jewish religion is it's super, super, super strict. It asks you to do everything, but then if you can't do it, we're like, let's make a deal. You know, <laughs> we really, so you have to say the Kaddish. He's the only one in the world who can say this Kaddish, and any rabbi will tell him he has to say this Kaddish. And they're like, okay, you're not saying the Kaddish? You can hire someone, it's fine. It's just as kosher, but you start with it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can't have a kosher Jewish wedding if like, if the wife doesn't want to go to the mikvah, like, you have to go to the mikvah. If you don't want to go to the mikvah, still kosher, it's fine. Skip the mikvah. You know what I'm saying? I really find that beautiful. I find that something that's both super strict, you know, and limiting and framing, and then also like really, really generous in that way. You know, so this idea is he's hired someone to say the Kaddish, and what he recognizes like a biblical thing is he's given away that right to mourn. You know, he feels like I can't get it back. And that's that's the arc of this book is us chasing him on it. You know, this idea of proxies back to that Moscow trip. My mother gave me $18 for it, cash money, to give to charity. Because guess what? Then nothing's happening to me on that flight because I'm not on that flight. Nathan talking to you is not on that plane anymore. Who's on that plane is an emissary who's sent to do a charitable operation. I'm on a flight doing a mitzvah. I'm a representative of a do-gooder to do a good deed, and that protects you. And that, you know, even selling the Passover chametz, when, you know, uh, Jews have to sell all their chametz on Passover, and you find the nice town Gentile, which are becoming more, it's, it's, it's going good. America's hanging together. We're all right. But, um, but you, you know, that person, that kindly neighbor who buys it, they become a proxy for the whole Jewish community. I think that's one of the nicest thing in America, like to have your neighbor represent, like a singular non-Jewish neighbor represents the whole community for a week. Like he becomes all of them. Like that's a beautiful, beautiful notion. So yes, he wants to find this proxy and to put things right. But uh, you know, back to going back to his life, I think it just comes from that notion that I started at the beginning, like that as years go by, you know, a friend who interviewed me about this book, who's like an NPR critic, uh, Glenn Weldon, who I love very much, but uh, he went to grad school with me and he said like, 25 year old, you couldn't have written this book. And that's also interesting, you know, to me about how, you know, watching life go by, which is, you know, back to the father in this book, my relationship with my father who's passed away has changed so much over this decade. Like, I didn't know those relationships continue. You know, we're here at a lecture in honor of someone. Like, you don't know that that, like, those, that relationship can still grow over time. That really interested me. And also those memories that you can alter those things where, I, you know, I think it's like snapping a rubber band. You know, we have students here 
to change, sometimes you have to make this radical leap. To leave orthodoxy, I like broke every rule I could in religion, like you have to like rip a limb off a living animal and eat it raw. You know, I was going through the Torah to find everything that was forbidden for me to, you know, like check off the list that was possible, you know? And then, but then I do, you can like, it's not even mellowing, it's just like shaping, seeing nuance to the world. And that's what also drives like the heaven part of this. I started to think, Memory has become a significant part of my work now in a different sense. So this, uh, the play I'm working on is called uh, What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, and it's based on the short story that I wrote. But I was in my 40s, and the way my sister and I make order of the world is, you know, if we meet a new couple, like some, like whatever, we'd be like, oh yeah, yeah, he would hide us and she would turn us in. Since I'm born, like, just always, not a joke, not a game. Like I'm telling you, like we mean it. You get assessed, you are assessed. But you know, when we meet people, who would hide us in the event of a second Holocaust? That is our first question. We want hiding places. I hadn't thought, I was in my 40s, and I was like, that seems pathological. That is probably the stuff of fiction. You know? And then I started to think into memory that way. And back to this, I thought of that yeshiva education and how it changes. You get this very beautiful biblical childhood. And then as soon as the boys hit puberty and might you know, kiss an Italian girl, the rabbi's heaven changes real quick. They get real nervous, and then you start getting these, you know, the nicer version of heaven. Like I said, it's this place of learning. You're learning, which is, I remember being really scared when I heard that. You're learning Torah 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Like, if you're a good boy, you're in heaven. If you're a bad boy, you're in hell. But they'd also tell a 13-year-old boy, heaven is you're sitting on a chair with God on one side and your mother on the other, and you just watch a movie of your life. What's to be afraid of, you know? But one of them, which is also central to this book, is this idea, which I love very much, which is uh, that heaven is this extraordinary, infinite feast, a table set, you know, with everything you could want, no diet, you know, you can have your carbs, you can have your sodium, everything, glot kosher, whatever, gluten-free, even if it's not, like, eat what you want for eternity, but you go to eat and you see God has taken your elbows away. That's this heaven, and if you are a selfish person and a greedy person, you're gonna stand there flailing for eternity, knocking food and starving. But if I feed you, sir, and you, if we reach across the table to each other, like, and then you are like having an eternal feast. You know, it's those kind of memories I've started tapping into and, and dreaming with dreamscapes, which I really am against dreams in fiction, except back to the worlds that you build for a Jew and a rabbi on a mission in Jerusalem, Jews take dreams seriously, like seven years of famine, seven years of feast. If it's a Jerusalem-related dream, like it's not even a dream in the book, it's another reality. So that's, that's the whole book, that's the setup, that is the you know, drive of the book. And one other element is the dot-com part, which really obsesses me, which I think also drove this book, and it's stripped out, it's maybe one paragraph in the book, even though I feel like it's in the spirit of this book, which I was the, I wish I was naughty again, seeing that friend from college, like, why didn't you make me smoke weed? You know, like, I don't know, I, I was like, so, you know, we were goody two-shoes, and the, the, like, we lived in this, our whole dorm was painted black, they were all dropping, there were like a few of us, we were in the craziest dorm, but I was so good, right? We were like, well, well-behaved kids. Yeah, I wish I'd been naughty and snuck out and run wild, but I would get in trouble for theological questions, you know? Like, that's what I'd get thrown out for, for like, challenging a syllogism, you know? Anyway, but like one of the things that I think probably is a thing that drove me away even of like these questions that nobody could answer. Again, uh, Ellen asked me to talk about this, you know, maybe we'll do it in the Q&A, but how you get to be a writer is because anyone who's a professor of literature who's a writer, it's because books saved you. You know what I'm saying? When I couldn't get answers, it was the books that I saw didn't have the answers. They weren't afraid to ask the questions. But really, one of the things was this idea of omniscience, of God knowing everything, knowing where everything everybody in here has done, what you're doing now, and what you're going to do next. You know what I'm saying? Literally, that's, and I said, like, that is just too much to ask, that, like, processing power. And what's really started to obsess me, which I wanted to put in this book, you know, on the internet part of it, which is we've sort of built a beta god. Like, that idea, my phone now, it's, you know, it's not a joke. It literally knows everything I've done. Like, if you are in the world, and again, I spent a year living in Malawi, like, they're plugged in there, too, in Zomba. Like, maybe there are some places there I saw where you could be, possibly not filmed or tracked, but most of the places on the globe now, you know, if you've, like, you are, I call him the good bomber for being the bad bomber, but this guy who tried to blow up, uh, you know, in 42nd Street in the tunnel, but he was a very good bomber for being such a bad, bad bomber. Terrible. But, like, when they had to have his court case, they had basically a movie of him moving through the city from CCTV cameras, from, store, like, you could just watch. So I'm saying if you've touched a smartphone in here, like, 
you have no secrets. You know what I'm saying? It's, we are tracked, everything we're done is known. Where we are right now is absolutely known. But I've noticed now with my Instagram, like it's not like, you know, it's not like I want a cookie and I, and I get an ad for food. It, you know what I'm saying? And it has some concept of hunger. It's like if I want a double stuffed Oreo, I open Instagram and it's a double stuffed. It's not a regular Oreo. You know what I'm saying? It's the double stuffed. You know, it's real. I just started talking to this artist woman who draws a lot about she's super feminist author like I talked to her like we've had a couple of conversations about maybe collaborating on something she paints these pictures that I love I literally I just sent her a scream I got an ad for a uh, uh, reusable period underwear today in fact my Instagram but I'm like they like the phone knows that I'm talking to a woman who's interested in female functions of the bot like she literally is interested in like menstrual but like I was like that is Cray cray. You know what I'm saying? It is tapped. It's that one's wrong, so that's not exacting, but again, I'm interested now. But anyway, but I'm just saying this idea of predictive technology, it literally knows what we want, what we're going. Like the ads know what's next. And I felt like that is literally that I questioned as a, you know, teenager, this idea that a machine, you know, can build it, that I couldn't believe that a god could know what everyone's doing. Like, it makes me think, you know, as spurring this book, maybe I need to be religious again, because maybe I was wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, I literally see now that omniscience is possible, like truly possible, because we have a really pretty good working version of it going right now. And I also want to say it's a Jewish god, because the internet is vengeful and unforgiving and does not forget. So it is an, not only have we built a god, we have built a very Jewish uh, Old Testament god. You know what I'm saying? Maybe that's the next, maybe that's internet 2.0 will be a turn the other cheek, you know, internet where you don't get, you know, uh, yeah, where where you don't get, I'm, you know, I'm afraid to say cancel. I might get canceled for saying cancel. Anyway, nonetheless, but yes, that really is the shape of the book. But I promised I'd leave time for questions, so I better stop right there. It's not. Is this on, Jamie? You can hear yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me just start by asking you a quick question, I think. Um, You've got the mic. So we talked a little bit at dinner a, about your becoming a writer. And I think your first collection of short stories was dedicated to your mother. Yes. You always acknowledge your mother in your books as have, you know, thanking her for reading your manuscripts. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering, when you first told your mother and your father that you were going to become a writer, were they supportive? Or what did they think of that idea? Oh, uh, I th you know what? My family's really good about stuff like that. So I think both terrified and horrified and supportive, if that's possible. Yeah, you know, we like, you know, I remember money worries growing. Like there was a lot of push. You know, I knew like when I was four to be like, I'm going to be, you know, you know, I'm going to. Uh, you know, trade monies. Like, literally, I was going to be like, I'm a stockbroker, you know, like, yeah, probably at five, I said arbitrage in the 70s. You know what I'm saying? Like, I knew this idea that you need to be able to take care of yourself, and there was a real fear of this kind of thing. But I think maybe this is it about exposure, about school, about taking that class. My mom, you know, women got married, uh, people are marrying young again, too. I hear a lot more now, but, you know, what she got married at 18 or whatever it is, but, like, she was a real super talented artist, you know, and married my dad, and we always had a love of art. I, like, I, I charge her with making me subversive. Like, we were super religious, but I went to museums, you know what I'm saying? Like, I remember getting taken into MoMA to say goodbye to Guernica when it was going back to Spain in, like, what is it, 78 or something like that? You know, these are, so I, I, there was a real respect and love for art. So yes, I think there was a terrible fear of being able to support yourself or to live, but, but an understanding. Also, I just didn't listen. My sister listened. I was very well behaved, but it's not like you could tell me what to do. I happened to have chosen to be well behaved. But I, yeah, it was, it was extraordinarily stubborn on that front. I think, I think they knew it's what I was going to do. And from the moment that was clear, they were really supportive of it. I mean, but you're asking on campus, so there's a part two about dreams. Like sometimes parents ask me, like with great terror, my kid wants to do, writing's the easiest one to support because it involves sitting alone in a room and turning off your devices and focusing. I was like, you should tell them you're even gonna pay their rent. If they can sit in that room, for, they will quit before you have to quit them. You know what I'm saying? So I think there's some things that are like gonna be, you know, easy to support. But I also think you don't know anything, like I really did, I never, I don't think I've ever talked about that on stage. Like, I was so afraid. I was working. I was, we didn't, like, I didn't go to summer camp when the other kids did. I was taking a train into the city to work in an arbitrage. You know, I was, like, studying for my Series 7 as a teenager. Like, I really was going to do this, you know, like that kind of thing. 
And then I understood what I really loved. And I thought like I could have like ended up at, you could spend your life at Bear Stearns. You could dedicate your life to something and then your pension's gone. There's no promises. Like you watch people's whole things. We don't have to go with stories of specific things. I'm saying, I think anybody who wants to do something is much more likely to succeed as like, you know, I'm gonna become a professional rock climber. I think the kid that's gonna climb 20 hours a day and practice holds and like rub their fingertips on gravel all night, you know, and sandpaper and just study roots and st like, I think that kid is so much more likely to, you know, you know, whatever it is, free solo El Capitan, that is a great movie to watch, except it's, a, we'll talk about the ethics of filming it nonetheless. But I'm just saying that success to me is so much more built in than making someone be miserable at whatever, you know what I'm saying? I don't want, you you need your appendix out. I don't want a miserable surgeon who really doesn't, you know, who wants to dance. Dance, surgeon, dance. You know what I'm saying? So I, I do think if you're asking me statistically, the chance is the world is scary and challenging. We watch this disruption. You could be, you know, I, I hope it's not someone in here have a hundred million dollars of taxi medallions and now they're worth 80 bucks. Like it's so crazy. Nothing, you know, it's a scary time, you know, right now on the planet. Like, I think you got to do what you want to do with full force. And also, you could be a very interesting something else after you try something. You've got to at least give yourself the chance to try. Back to this question that's turned out really personal. My mom should have had a chance to like be, you know, I always tell her now, go draw, go paint. Like sometimes she draws, but like that idea, I thought at least I'm going to take the chance on the thing that I want to do. Thank you. Questions? Um, throughout the story, um, I get to see, we're basically reading about someone who's just like goes from simple cottage.com or just like something in the 1990s, yeah, just late 90s. And then we cut to like a newer generation, a new web website, and this we need like Gabriel to understand. Yes. To try to explain everything to him. Um, with this, so I guess what I'm asking is like, how is this feeling like trying to relate to like older, like older generations, trying to connect to like the newer technology and everything? Just like trying to like connect of all this stuff. Oh, like. how does that feel, or what it's? Uh, oh, I uh, I guess that's that I, that idea. You know, I think one of the things I like about writing, and I, you know, we're all. For, it's really a kind sport, or at least these days we don't have good British fights so much anymore. But uh, you know, like the older generations, like you know, I have, uh, you know the young up and coming writers that I befriend and then all my you know friends in their you know 80s and stuff like that like i think you know certain sports keep you connected and i think writing you don't function if you don't stay up on it but i did want to look at that bridge of just i don't know it's you know maybe it goes to that thing that i was saying about politics of having uh, watch the world change politically, like that you remember things, you know, even to talk about remembering winter, you know what I'm saying? I remember when we used to skate on the pond in my town, which is now, I think, boils through February. You can, you know, make hard boiled eggs in it. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a weird thing to, so, yes, I'm both, we talk, you know, part of this talk is about memory, but I think it's really that idea of, uh, I wanted to look at a different kind of bridge and technically, Tech, the technological is another kind of bridge. What he's asking about is there's a student when Shuli needs to find this guy who hasn't you know, spoken to in 20 years to the internet. He, needs to, he doesn't even know how to turn on the new smooth Mac. He doesn't touch computers anymore. He needs someone to help him with the technology. And yeah, I really wanted to look at that bridge and how we bridge and how you know, that we teach up and learn up. Like there's all kind of wisdom and age and then there's like reverse wisdoms where you have to like learn, you know, ask someone to help you. Because I do have that memory. My grandmother's, she would clean the house in white gloves, very New England, clean the house in white gloves, click, 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 high heels, white gloves, very fastidious, spotless house. And then she'd have a nice cigarette, you know, and a cup of, and she'd turn the radio on, maybe a spot of soda. But she'd turn this radio on, same station every year, same seat, same ashtray, same cigarette with lipstick on the edge that I can see on that filter. But like that notion, I remember, I'd go to like change the radio station and she'd freak out like, my station, you know, like, don't touch that. I was like, just put it back. But now if like my nephew takes my iPhone, I hear myself being like, don't touch that. You know, like, like I'm just gonna unlock, don't change anything. I know where, and I thought like, oh my God, like it's happening to me. Where like, I know how to know, do the stuff I know how to do, you know, and then you have to choose to stay current. Now I'll be like, okay, I got a Zoom, this week I got a Zoom, student. whatever it is, they tell you, you know, like, so I think I, yes, I wanted to look, this is a book about circles, about giggling, about those connectivity to generations past to the father, but I thought technology is the generation in this book that points where the, where the world spins in the other direction. In the book, 
can you hear me? <laughs> in the book, it, you go from like it, the at his sister's house was saying, and then going out to dot com, and the next thing, he's like religious. It's yes. There's no. Yes. Why he really uh, the tradition? Um, why he made that switch? Right. Yeah, you know, back to like fifth book and things like that. Things that become important to you, like it was like a big aesthetic choice. And again, books are books are points of discussion. I'm I'm writing this. The, this play that I'm working on now, and we have, you know, like we have readings, and you bring groups in to see it. Like the idea is, people need to have stuff to art. Like, what work does, what it does for me is make thought, make conflict, make argument. I don't want any. Like, confused is not bad. If if this opening that's in Memphis, and half of you think it's in Detroit, I failed as a writer. That's like loss of control. But you make commitments and aesthetic choices and ideas. And yes, this one comes up. You know. You know, some people truly embrace it, and some people really, you know, have trouble with it. But like, I love that skipping of space because that's, I, I reality to me, a fictional reality. It's called a fictional reality. It's a reality. It is real. You know what I'm saying? There's no other art form. I'm like adamant about this. You don't watch a movie like if you watch, you know, the new Star Wars, and then you think that happened to you. Like, go to a neurologist. Like, something's not right. Like, a picture you remembers a picture. A book you say like, oh, when did that happen to me? Oh no, I read that. It builds realities. And we were just talking at dinner when I, you know, Portrait of a Lady came up. I read that in Binghamton in you know in the 80s, and the book comes up, and I see a train, I see a room, I see a table set for tea across a rolling hill. Like. It forms memories. It is my job to build realities, no less. If it is ever not real to you for a second, that is not a good, that book is broken. You know what I'm saying? And to me, that's this notion. I've used it as a reference twice, but my friend, I have not seen her since 1991. Is that, it's more than 10 years now, but that's like 30 fucking years ago. You know what I'm saying? Like, she and I, like, she walked out, we hugged. We don't care about the, we're gonna hug. Anyway, we do care. Wash your hands, we'll elbow touch tonight. Let's all be really careful, but nonetheless. An old hug can happen. But, um, but I'm just saying, like, that whole point is I'm absent 30 years. Like, that is reality. Like, we just picked up where we left off. We are, I'm, I'm going to talk to her after, but we are missing 30 years. But it didn't seem less real. I knew who it was. Like, it all came rushing back. And I, like, I feel like that's how story forms and certain things that interim time doesn't matter. And I didn't want my reader to have to read through that. And maybe, by the way, back to things like why I love new forms. As I said, I reached out to this wonderful, talented artist. I wanted to like, I'll do the words, you do the art. Like, I love collaboration. As you learn, I have learned more doing drama. And maybe it's the drama leaking into fiction that's also behind that ju jump. Because in the novels, we love to explain everything. You know, it's like you can have 600 pages about why, you know, why I have you know, why I drink too much and why my wife is telling me to drink less. That would be like 700 pages of novel. Like on theater, on the stage, you play drunk, you play sober, and now change. You know what I'm saying? I'm interested in the, like, how reality forms and how drama works. And I felt to me that it was much more moving for someone's life. Those are lost years to him and they should be lost years to us. That was, he was off the derrick, he was off the path, and I felt we didn't need to see that, that like stepping right into his brain regaling us over those missing years. Like that to me is how real life works. But I understand, again, I don't control like some people, you know, it's, I understand it's a, a wrestle point, you know, in a book group. <laughs> Do we have time? Yeah, I don't have a clock. We're time for one or two more yeah, or no more? Yeah, we have time for plenty more. Yeah, oh, sorry. George. Uh, Mr. Englander, thank you very much. Oh, Nathan, much. please. Um, I, I confess at the outset I have not read your book. Um, I downloaded better. it on my Kindle. I read three pages. As um, long as you bought it. But I, well, I bought it. <laughs> I paid for it. That's all we care about. So, so, so the question does not relate to the book. Um, it relates to something you said when you were describing uh, the child, you know, in putting him in the room um, and focusing. And this last hour has been very entertaining. You are incredibly creative. You are not so focused. Yes. So could you please, my question is, could you describe your writing process? Well, you, you just summed it up, which is like, I, you, uh, yeah, that usually comes up. And then I say, and this is why I don't have a radio show. <laughs> like, the, I remember still a friend in high school while I got panicked people standing in a circle while I'm telling nine jokes simultaneously, you know? And then she's like, just stay with it. It'll all come back to, but like, literally, this is it. I'm very thankful to get asked to give, and I've learned to be myself, which is it. It's scattered, it's in circles like this. It's like, 
you don't you know what you've left your homes everyone's really busy and it's like if i'm not going to be my true self here like sometimes it isn't i can do like a typed up keynote but like what else tonight but to really be me and 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 do the map but, of but, my brain but what i want to know is when you sit down to write yes what is that process like for you yeah we we are a multiplicity of selves so this is like you know on stage, me at a university, like what it is is what you hear tonight, the, the thoughts like that, that's how it looks all over the pages. If I write, you know, I used to go to the, I think they changed that room at the British Museum. You could look at people's longhand drafts. They used to keep it out and now it's away. But you'd see people like write down the page and write back up the page and like, it's everywhere. I, I, some people have very organic, a process that's very like laid out, I'm gonna write, you know, this book has 10 chapters. I know each chapter. I'm going to execute that, this one in this data. I have friends who work that way. I really believe in the spirit of the piece. It, it comes from a really organic, deep down place where I just find it and then follow it. So the process, there's many parts to the process. But first, there is an extraordinary amount of pages, of circles, of ideas. That's why I love the form. Because up here, I can try and control it, but it just makes me feel suffocated if I have to like talk in order. You know, that's boring to me. You know, you'll get some ideas tonight. I'll make some jokes. So really why I love the form is what you're asking is because then I can put my brain in order. You know what I'm saying? So I may write the end. I may write the middle. I might have 700 pages that are off to the side that are about when almond trees bloom. And that's why I love this form, which is you will not see it. I will not, back to not shaking hands. You know whose hands I haven't shaked even before this virus is writers who say, oh, I wish I'd spent more time with that book. Or I would, I would change the end now that it's out. Like nothing goes into the world until I would not change a comma. So for me, the world is chaos, like I'm a very, uh, you know, addled and confused person. Like the idea of having this space where I can sit, I don't care about time, I don't care about money, I don't care about fa anything, like the, ch the things I turn down, the things I won't do, that I spent 10 years on my second book was a very bad, you know, economic choice, sure, I don't care. I just care about making things. I really believe in the craft part of this. So yeah, the process is sitting alone, is imagining, is, laying it all down and then back, these two questions are married to each other. I pronounce you, you know, uh, wife and wife, but like, and then it's an active elision of negative space, of infinite drafting. The, the story that I owe my whole career to is the 27th man that I wrote. These writers, Stalin had murdered these, uh, I don't like injustice, so that's the other point. I don't really write about Jews that I was saying at the beginning. I write about what the, the whole world's Jewish. I write about injustice a lot and making things fair. I want to put things right. This is a book, if you do get through it on your Kindle, about putting things right. But like Stalin had killed these Jewish writers. And, you know, and again, there were women involved and there was, it was men and women and, you know, and anti fascist. But, you know, the general story was this night of the murdered poets where he'd killed the last of the Yiddish writers in one of his rages all on the same day. And I heard about this right as the wall was coming down. You're like, and I just, I heard about it because my professor was a Russia expert and her husband was a huge Russia. Like, nobody knew this story. Like, like Stalin shouldn't get to win. Like, he'd kill these writers with, the, like, the best story of their life to tell. And I just thought, I waited years. That's how I became a writer, back to Ellen's question. I waited for someone to tell this story. These writers deserve their story. They, they've, they've been erased. It shouldn't be gone. And when no one did, I wrote that story. And that story, like, I think it took me... You know, I got the idea at 19 and it came out in a book form when I was 29, like a decade. And that's where I learned this process, which always been, I drafted and drafted and redrafted. I have, I, it's definitely taller than me, which is not that impressive, but maybe we'll get a taller person up here. But nonetheless, I must have like, you know, six, seven, eight feet of that story, which is until things sound the way you want them to sound. So yeah, it, back to ideas of creation, I think it really maps you know, why I say like, you know, this stuff from childhood that holds with me, notions of creation, which is you take, you know, tobu bohu. I love, that's one of my famous English, favorite English words, uh, right? It's tobu bohu. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's in English, straight up. Anyway, but like you take this chaos and you make order. And to me, like nothing is calming to me in the world except getting a sentence right. So yeah, the process is much like this. <laughs> anyway, we have time for, yeah. Well, it's, it's quite, quite a memorable time for me and all of us li listening to you. 
I found Kaddish.com, a book of order, <laughs> because what I saw was this man, Shuli, which you think about becomes Shul. Oh, nice. Yeah. And he had this problem of going to Shul. Uh, but, but he and Kemi, at, I'm going to give this away, those of you who haven't read it, but you're talking about making things right and fair. Yeah. He makes things right and fair at the end yeah. for his father, yeah, yeah. for himself. He performs a mitzvah. You know, those two men say Kaddish for all, yeah, the, guy, the, yeah. all the people they conned. Yeah. And that, that was a glorious ending. I also see a Faustian bargain going on. But, and, and like in Faust, Faust wins. Yeah. Yeah. And so does Shuley. Uh, and, and I like the way uh, you also, I also thought of Jacob and Esau. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, that's, that's yes. <laughs> yeah, because he's going to give away his rights, his birthrights. Well, yeah. And, and, but, but he claims them back. All this, this chaos and his guilt and his mind and his love. Uh, what, the year after his father's death, his tears are for himself. Yes. And then, and then he, he, he needs to claim his money back, not his birthright. But then, then things fall into place. And he is saying Kaddish not only for his father, yeah. but for all yeah, yeah. people in, in Israel who, yeah, who yeah. were calling. No, thank you for that closer. I mean, I think that's it. It's like, it shouldn't be a syrupy thought. I really do think it's in reference to like, what's, you know, just how I, you know, I'm not aware when I'm writing it, but like things I hunger for in the world today, like my word, if I give you my word, I do something, like I'm just, you know, just shocked at like, just this idea of us just, you know, you know, on every level of society, but like, you know, this, you know, and especially on global levels of like, you know, commitments and promises. And like, I just think I got obsessed with someone who just wants to put things right, like at whatever cost. And also it's like a quixotic journey, which also interests me, which I think why I mentioned a climbing movie. I'm very interested, you know, like that his wife, it's, you know, that she has to put up with it. We, everyone, you know, especially, uh, we all have relationships, whatever they are in whatever form, but that we uh, sometimes get these things in our head that are constructs, but nonetheless, like, I'm interested in the drive for anything. You know what I'm saying? I'm always, when we're rescuing people on top of Everest, I'm like, we can leave. I'm not so sure we need to, like, when people risk their lives, I'm like, you got up there, get down. But, you know, I'm very interested in a fictional way about this notion of people getting it into their head to, you know, get on a journey. And yes, I was very, very obsessed with this notion of Shuli fixing it with everyone, as you mentioned, with the people, you know, with his wife, with his kid, with his father, with his memory, and with himself. And I think, you know, I, I, I think it's an, honor, an honorable, if neurotic, Make up for a person, and, and don't. And also, he remembers that his father said he'll be good, he'll be fine, and well, his wife yeah. says you can forgive yourself. Uh, so that those would be. I'm learning to let myself be in the book. I do not forgive myself anything. So I was like, I was thinking about this notion. I bet some people can forgive themselves anything. You know what I'm saying? I'll remember, like, you know, if I didn't deliver a punchline, right? I'll be like, that joke fell flat in 1974. You know, like you can forgive yourself. And that notion of never growing up, which I don't know if everyone feels that, but it's that very strange notion where he really does need this fatherly support. Like, as I said, I just had a big birthday. I don't know when I'm going to feel like a grown up. It's really interesting. You know what I'm saying? Like, I. You know, I know when I'm like being a professor, be a professor, and being a writer, be a writer. But like this sense, I think it's built into some people, and I have it. I never, I never feel like a grown. You know, what I'm saying I'm capable in the world. I can do my things. I can make my phone call. But like, it's that notion. I was very interested in that, in that way that when you think back to parents or something, or a certain part of our brain is still seeking that extraordinary, you know, kind of support. So. Nathan, when you're in the middle of writing, yeah. do you give yourself a certain amount of time to write each day or a certain number of pages, or you just stay in the room and continue to write as long as you're feeling it? Uh, it depends where we are in uh, parenting or, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I used to be a very bad boyfriend. I mean, I would just work all night and sleep all day and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I'm extraordinarily disciplined. But back to things, you know, 
uh, chicken or egg, but a lot of that stuff of, of religious life, like this idea of repeated routines. I'm very interested in dissociative states and the subconscious and literally how our synapses fire. It's not accidental. The same thing if you want to like hit a basketball, if you want to like, you know, if you have to take a foul shot to win the game and your Nike contract's on the line and like 70,000 people are booing you, like that same thing that an archer has to do, that a yogi does, that a religious person does, that a writer does, it is about training the brain. You can enter this it, you know, true dissociative states. Like you never read a word that I wrote as conscious me that's talking to you. There's a part of each day where I fall away and you know, you've trained, basically every writer has trained their hands to type while daydreaming. So it's I've like t taught myself to like move the pieces of a dream and then type at the same time, but it's not me. It's 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 a subconscious act, and that needs routine. And I think more you train, it's like being compulsive versus obsessive. You know, I don't know how to separate the person. I, I could smoke crack with you after this event and be like, that was delicious, and then go back to dinner. But if I'm like I walk on that side of the street, you know what I'm saying? Like once a routine builds, then it becomes an anchor for me. So I think it's that notion of like, it used to be building up. I t anyone who wants to write in here, I got this from Frank Conroy, who, you know, who was one of my teachers who used to tell us, it's about Zitzfleisch, the ability to sit in a chair. So you need to compose three hours a day, six days a week. That's your starting point. You know, and then you go from there. So now it's about training myself to take a day off or training myself that a person's allowed to have an evening or, you know, listening. You know, my daughter should go like this, like, uh, dad, dad, daddy, daddy, Nate. <laughs> she knows I answered a Nate, or I'm like, oh, like I go off into my world, like off into the, but, uh, you know, so I really think, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's big routine is, you know, how I survive. And also it's about controlling the routine, you know, does that answer it? Yeah. Should we call it that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, maybe last question. I feel like, yeah. No, no, thanks. I'm good. Here's one of the things I'm really curious about. So I can imagine your write as go back to your writing process. Yeah. The chaos and the ideas and the free flowing and, and how liberating that must be and yeah. really cool. I'm wondering when you come to the end, is it an abrupt end or is it a slowing down that happens when you're how do you know you're at the end? Oh, uh, uh, I used to make a Charlton Heston joke, but those jokes aren't funny anymore. But um uh Oh yeah, just it's it's clear to me. Um, it's a Gerhard Richter thing that I think about. I was at this lecture about like this very famous painting of Richter, which is like this table, and it's a, the German painter, and it's like this you know hyper realistic table, and then the whole middle is like this you know circle painted over it. And I listened to this whole like smart you know lecture about how it was about like German and the rebuilding post the war and this like massive thing and then I, I I knew exactly what happened I like went to this very like to the Richter expert I was like can I give you my theory of that painting that's not about like industrial revolution and post-war and the rebuilding of German society it's like I said it's like I think he painted this table and it was finished and then he's like it's not finished it's horrible and it was 4 a.m. and he started to erase the whole thing and he's in there in his studio like circling it and destroying it and then he was like Yes, and then he stepped away. Like I, I'm telling you, I'd go to my grave. I know there's like a, you know, that painting is like central to his career. But to me, I'm like, I know that's what happened. Like I've never met, you know, like anyway. But uh, yeah, so I, I think it's this notion of. Also, back to how I function in the world, nothing's clear to me, nothing's makes sense to me. I will suffer after this reading in my hotel and being like, what did I say tonight? You know, like everything is torturous to me, except, you know, back to that gentleman's question about order. It is very clear to me. It's the only thing that's done, think about it. When I finish this book, the publisher buys it, hopefully, but they bought this one. Like, I've literally sold it. Back to this woman's, you know, pointing out birthrights and things like that. I literally don't own this book anymore. You know what I'm saying? They like, if I sell enough, they send me some money, but it's like I am literally I don't own it it is not mine and and I and that to me is such a giant clear thing it is the one thing in my life that there's an end point you know what I'm saying there's no conversation we could have that there'll be an end point to you know like there's no we're going to end this after this you know I'll take your question but like you know nothing ends for me and it, it is so clear with art and craft that like there has to be a moment yes it really gets to be done and you know you also need people around you who you trust when I hand this book in let's say it was like 650 pages you know or the one before yeah there's like a 700 page draft and I can literally like 
cut it in half and cut out 400 pages and my editor will be like, there was a line about a cookie. And I was like, oh, I was missing that line too. You know what I'm saying? There, there, I know it's like subjective and like chaos theory and many worlds and there's infinite versions of a book, but there aren't. There really is a right and wrong. You know what I'm saying? You have to stand by it and someone can be, say, you know, like whether this jump is working or not working, like you must stand, there really is an end point. It is the most joyous thing in my life that there is a point where they end. You know, you pick an order, the stories go to a collection and that's it. So yeah, it's really, really clean to me. Again, I torture everyone around me. I'm probably not fun to be around in those weeks, but I will recognize it with, with help. That's, that's why I'm mentioning other people. With help, I will know that it's done, and then I will see that it's done. Maybe that's one of the differences between writing fiction and nonfiction. You know, I can write an article yeah. and then do a revised edition of that article or a book, Yeah. Um, and I can go in and change certain things or... Yeah, you're dealing with fat. Yeah, because the because the ground beneath it can change. Exactly. That's the point. But right. this these worlds are yeah. But once you're as in they a are. short story collection somewhere, yeah. the stories are there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah I think. Oh. No, someone else had. Oh. Go ahead. And then yeah. This last last yeah this man yes okay. we're having uh, a Geneva this I'm, is Geneva I'm, Convention issue. I will answer I quick. I yeah well I I found that toward the at the end where, yes. where his dream was yes. he. He seemed he took himself, and then he said he satisfied someone else. Yes. And I can't get into that. Yeah. I can't understand yeah. how you could do that. Um, he had no. I I don't understand that relationship. Yeah. Oh, okay. so there's a uh, uh, a pornographic moment at the front of the book. Back to using this thing that, that ends up returning in a dream. And that goes back very quickly to this internet thing and back to all the ideas where, you know, it's uh, like to my family, that was a truly shocking scene. You know what I'm saying? Like it makes the book pornographic, but it's like that notion, which is back to those relationships in the internet. We're having societal breakdown. So at the beginning, he's watching this like, you know, I don't know what percentage of like people or men look at pornography, it's got to be, I'll go with in the high 99%, you know what I'm saying? Like this idea. So back to, if I'm talking about putting things right, it's my job as a writer to do the most pressurized form of things. So back to him, there's like a, a gender switch in there, but we can talk about ideas of like Shrina and the female god and like transfers in the word Kadosh, which both means holy, but Kadesh is pros I'm not going to do a deep Kabbalistic dive on that moment, but to the idea of this woman is there's people in the fucking internet. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're looking, like everyone's going to look at the porn's not going to stop, but like at least right, like I thought that was the most pressurized form. So like I'm saying, I, I put, I'm, I'm not on Twitter now. Maybe I'll go back to it. I say like a bunch of people say nice stuff and someone sees too much nice stuff about you. So they'll be like, your book sucks or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, or whatever, I like forget like what people are dealing with who like are journalists and and anti-Semitism and rate like it's just but the idea of saying that to another human being that you wouldn't say in here, like it's 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 causing a societal breakdown. I don't think they're like shooting up a black church or shooting up a synagogue without the help. It really eases us into societal fucking breakdown. You know what I'm saying? So to me, the best example for novelistic form is to say, you can look at this porn video and look at this woman doing what she has to do and then she goes home at night and takes a shower and like that's, so I wanted him to understand part of that it seemed to me the most extreme and clearest and fictional example to say there's people in the machine. Just because someone's a public figure, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know anyone. Back to Philip Roth, I remember before, like two books ago came out when he was alive and I said, Philip, I'm so nervous. Like, am I ever gonna feel, I'll feel stronger now. I'll be able to handle the reviews better and the, you know, anything better. And he said, no, no, you're gonna get, your skin will get thinner and thinner until I can hold you up to the light. Like, it doesn't get easier to be out, you know, like when you see a Britney Spears shave her head and lose her mind and everyone think that's funny. It's because we take a little girl and we make her the most famous thing in the world. That's not, I don't know her, her genetics or her brain chemistry. I'm saying that happened because it's, un, you can, we break people all the time. So back to having a pornographic example in this book and then a pornographic reckoning, it's because I wanted him as a character to have to recognize there's people in the machine, whether you're insulting them or looking at them or scrolling through them or saying bad things to your partner like Nate looks, you know, fat on Instagram today, whatever. Like, I just think we've built a thing that is allowing us to practice breaking down humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, a 
if, if you really, so much. Just a few short words before we all leave. First of all, we'll be selling Kaddish.com out in the lobby. And Nathan, you know you're going to stay and sign some copies for people of your book. Um, I also want to tell you that in two weeks from tomorrow, uh, Michael Cohen, who is the chair of Judaic Studies at Tulane University, will be coming here to Fairfield. He was supposed to come in December on that one day that we had of ice. Uh, he's going to be talking about his recent book. It's called Cotton Capitalists, Jewish Entrepreneurship in the Reconstruction South. And it's really a fascinating book about how these Jewish immigrants, largely German Jewish immigrants, went and settled in the South and became kind of the middlemen between plantation owners, that is, freed slaves, who wound up owning plantations in the South after the Civil War, and store owners. And they became the middlemen, and from there they became involved more broadly in finance, and some of them went to New York, and you know, the Lehman Brothers among them. Uh, it's really a fascinating story, and again, Michael will be here two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, I also want to say, Last thing, I know some of you were with us, I think it was only last week when David Miola was here from the University of South Alabama. I did make a pitch uh, after the lecture. I'm going to do the same thing now. You know, the Carl and Dorothy Bennett Center for Judaic Studies uh, has been here at the university for 26 years. Uh, we are the oldest Judaic Studies Center at any Jesuit college or university in the United States. Although my chair in Judaic Studies is endowed, our center has no budget from the university. Uh, and therefore, we really do rely on donations from people like you. And so if you'd like to see programs like this continue, and without the generosity of the Feigenson family, we would not have this lecture this evening. Um, we are in the middle of uh, a fundraising campaign. We have a challenge grant. The Frank Jacoby Foundation of Bridgeport is willing to match $10,000 if we can raise $10,000. We are well on our way to that goal. We began this campaign at the end of January. We're running it to the end of the fiscal year, which is June 30th, 2020. We have forms in the back. Whatever you can give, really, $15, 20 36 you know, 54 500, 1,000, anything, um, really will help show your support for the Bennett Center and for the many programs that we bring both to the university community and to the general community as well. My thanks to Nathan Englander for being here. This was really fabulous and inspires me to take some time for myself this summer and write. So thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for being here with us. <laughs>